Welcome to the Winter Session of Growth Groups 2021. An all new year calls for an all new study. This time we're going to spend 12 weeks in the book of Psalms. Our study is called Prayers of the Heart, which is perfect because that's what the Psalms are. So I hope you've had a chance to look through the study guide. It's just some discussion questions to help you um, reflect and ponder. Some um, great discussion questions for our small groups to meet. So I hope you've had a chance to um, get that. If you registered for this study, I have emailed it to everybody who's registered. So if you don't have it in your email, then uh, go online and register for the study. Even if you can't participate in a group, that's okay. Um, you're welcome to join us on, on YouTube, um, that's fine. But to get you a copy of the study guide, I need you to register so I have your email. That's it. So that's all for housekeeping. Welcome to Growth Groups Winter 2021. We're in the book of Psalms. So I hope you have your discussion guide. Hope you have your Bible handy. Um, and I just want to introduce you right quick to the um, the study is by Eugene Peterson. You're familiar with him. If you have ever read, let's see if I have it, um, the Message Bible. If you have ever read this or referred to this, it's a paraphrase of the Bible, so not a direct translation, but it's a really good study tool uh, because it's a paraphrase of the Bible. So if you are familiar with this, you're familiar with Eugene Peterson. It's the guy who wrote that, and he um, developed this study. So he laid it out into the 12 weeks. I have adapted some of his discussion questions for our discussion questions, and I'm using some of his material. So that's where our study comes from. Um, and before we get started, I just want to tell you, um, settle in, because first I'm going to talk about the Psalms in general. I'm going to give an introduction to the Psalms, why we study it, what we expect to find as we study it, and then I'll get into the first lesson for today. Sometimes in growth groups, we've had made those two separate weeks. So one week where we can just give an introduction and then one week where we can start the first lesson. I'm going to do two in one. Um, it won't be too terribly long, but I just wanted to tell you that up front, that this will be our introduction and then we'll switch into week one. So first, a little background on Psalms. If you take your Bible and stick your thumbs right in the center and open it up, you are probably in the Psalms or very near it because the Psalms are right in the middle of your Bible. Um, in the Old Testament, and the Psalms are a book of prayer and poetry. That's what it is. That's what we come to the Psalms to find. There are 150 of them. We're not going to do all of 150. We're going to jump around a bit. And they have various authors, David being the one most often named. Um, but a lot of them are anonymous. So we just sometimes refer to um, the psalmist says because we don't know who wrote all of them. And a little bit about what the Psalms are. Just like you might look into a mirror to see a reflection of your physical self, you can look into the Psalms. Some say that the Psalms can be used this way. You can look into the Psalms to see a reflection of your, your inner spirit, the deepest part of you, your emotions, um, and, and your humanity is reflected there in the Psalms. Um, they can reveal a lot of things to us, things um, like sin and sorrow and anger and guilt and joy and triumph. Um, it's all there, kind of the whole gamut of human emotions we're going to find here in the Psalms. If you recall from the Gospels, when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray, he gave them the Lord's Prayer. You know this, the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So it's helpful to think about the Psalms as an expanded version of the Lord's Prayer, or actually chronologically speaking, the Psalms came first. So the Lord's Prayer is a condensed version of the Psalms. So that's helpful as we approach this book to know what it is. It's, it's God's words to us um, to teach us how to pray, ultimately, is what it is. You're going to find a lot, all of the same features of the Lord's Prayer in the Psalms. It's all there. Adoration and praise. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Adoration and praise is our, are in the Psalms. A yearning for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's in the Psalms. A plea that God would provide for us all that we need. Give us this day our daily bread. That's in the Psalms. A request for forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those. For our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And a concern that we would live well in a sinful world. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's all there in the Psalms. The same as it is in the Lord's Prayer. But it's obviously much expanded. So the Psalms are given to us by God to speak about God to God. 
think about that. Let that settle in. It's it's um, it's a very powerful book because it's a it's God's words for us to pray back to Him. It allows us to present ourselves honestly. Sometimes our prayers can be a little clumsy, or sometimes we um, we might attempt to just hide and hold some things back in our prayer life. And the Psalms lays it all out there, very honestly, very authentically. Our whole selves, all of humanity, and the depths of human emotion is there in the Psalms. Um, the Psalms teach us how to lament in a godly way. If you know what lament is, it's it's expressing our grief and our sorrow and pain. That's lament. It teaches us how to do that in a godly way. It teaches us how to wait and hope in a godly way. How to grieve in a godly way. How to confess in a godly way. When we take those darker emotions and we turn them in on ourselves, that can be very, very destructive. Um, but when we turn them to God and we express them to God in our prayer, um, that's transforming them into life-giving, um, something life-giving, when we can just express that to God and lay it there to Him. Like I said, the, the Psalms covers the whole gamut of human emotions, all of it, providing a reflection of, of our, our depression, anger, frustration, jo joy, um, uh, gladness. We find it all here in the Psalms. So we're going to go through those um, 12 that Peterson has laid out for us. Um, John Calvin is a theologian who said something so cool about the Psalms. He says that they are the anatomy of the soul, which is really cool. He says, there is not an emotion of which anyone can be conscious that's not here represented as in a mirror, or rather the Holy Spirit has here drawn to the life, all the griefs, sorrows, fears, doubts, hopes, cares, perplexities, in short, all the distracting emotions with which the minds of men are prone to be agitated. Wow, it's all here. And here's another very special thing about praying the Psalms. These ancient prayers that we find in Psalms connect our personal walk with God to the, the, the corporate life of the entire church across all centuries, all time, and the whole globe. We all when we pray these psalms, we're all praying together, corporately, the same words. Um, so that's kind of a powerful thing to think too. As we as we pray the psalms, um, we are praying with the corporate church. The psalms have two features I mentioned, prayer and poetry. They're not doctrinal essays. That is not what we come to the psalms expecting to find. Um, the psalmists are more interested in how something felt than in what it meant. So it's sort of kind of like reading someone's diary is what we've come to the Psalms to see. Because the Psalms are prayer, they require that we deal with our actual humanity when we come before God. The words get below the surface and go straight to our depths. Sometimes it's not even comfortable where we're going to go in the Psalms here. Peterson has us praying things like praying our hate, which I never thought of before praying our death, if we think about our own mortality. Um, so some of these things might not even be comfortable for us, things we're not used to bringing to God in prayer, but the psalmist does that, and we're going to do it too. Also, the psalms require us to deal with God, not just talk about God. So that's going to be a very different approach for us. We usually come to, to Scripture to study and to learn about God, and that's not what the psalms do. So I hesitate to even call it a study, because this one's not really a study. This is a journey, um, learning how to most honestly deal with God and respond to God, not learn about God. Because the Psalms are poetry, they're filled with intense language and a lot of imagery. Um, most people think poetry is just decorative speech, but that does not get at the essence of what poetry is. Poets tell us what our eyes and our ears miss because they're so distracted by external stimuli, right? That you might see it, but not really see it. You might hear it, but you really didn't process it. And so the poet draws attention to those things we might otherwise have missed. I love what Eugene Peterson says. He says, poetry doesn't so much tell us something we never knew as bring into recognition what was latent or forgotten or overlooked. Isn't that so true? There's so much that we miss that's right in front of us, but we just didn't think about it that way. We didn't process it. Um, so the Psalms helps us do that. It is that kind of poetic language. Knowing this, as we approach the Psalms, we are not looking for ideas about God. That's not what we're coming to Psalms to find out. We're not looking for ethical directives. We're not looking for good theology. Again, we are 
exploring what it means to respond to God. And here's where poetry and prayer come together. The poetry gets to the root of things, the deepest depths, and prayer is the language of response to God, how we respond to God. Instead of talking about him, it's talking to him. The Psalms resist discussions. We are not here to, to learn about God. We're here to respond to God. And the Psalms are arranged into five books. And of course, we refer to it as one, as the book of Psalms, but it's actually arranged in five books. And we know that because at the end of each section, you don't have to write this down, but if you're curious, 41, 72, 89, 106, and 150, at the end of those sections, there are formula sentences that cue us in that this is the end of that section. Now we're launching an all new book. And just to give you an example, I won't read all five, but like I said, they're formula sentences. So they're all very, very similar. But each section ends, or each book ends this way. I'm in Psalm 41. So this is the end of the first book. It says, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. So that's the wrap up of each book. There are five of those in Psalms. They're not sorted by theme or anything, so we can't break it up that way. But that conclusion um, sentence is how we know we've ended one book and started another. So here is something interesting that Eugene Peterson points out that, in full disclosure, I had not thought of before. He says, um, regarding these five books, where else in the Bible can you um, think of that has a set of five books? So we, here we, in, we have these five books of Psalms. Where else is another set of five books? I'll give you a clue. We have a word for this in Latin, Pentateuch, five, five books. Um, the first five books of the Bible go together as a set. Some call them the, the books of Moses. The first five books go together as a set. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And now we have the five book of the Psalms, like bookends. And here's what's interesting about that. The first five books of the Bible are God addressing us. And this set in the Psalms are us responding to him. So that's what's cool about these bookends. God, God addresses us and we respond to him. So think of it that way as we approach the Psalms. Um, God is, God's word, his revelation to us in scripture has not done its complete work until we, it evokes a response in us. We respond to him and that's what the Psalms are. He reveals himself and we pray in response to that. And the Psalms ultimately are training in how to do this. So while the in the rest of scripture, we approach our Bible studies and, and ask, what is God saying to me in this book? In the Psalms, the question is, how do I respond to God? That's the question we bring to it. And it teaches us how to do that honestly, authentically, um, faithfully, to um, bring this this whole new mindset of, of to pray, not to study. So I, that's why I hesitate to even call it a study. We're going to call it a journey through Psalms, if I can remember to use the right word. Of course, the two are intertwined, pray and study, but we're, we're emphasis, our emphasis this time is on prayer and response. So Eugene Peterson um, drew out 12 different Psalms that we'll walk through. They're not in any particular order um, that represent the 12, 12 dimensions of your inner thought life, 12 questions, things that you'll reflect on as we go through and we'll express to God. Um, okay, I think that's it for my introduction to the book and what we're going to come to to explore as we go through Psalms. So let me pray for us here, and then we'll get started with lesson one of our study. Father God, thank you, first of all, for these women who've gathered today, hungry, um, hungry to know you better and to connect better with you. And thank you for this study that we're about to dig into, that it not only teaches us about you, but helps us respond to you. And thank you for these prayers and poetry that give voice to our human emotions um, and the struggles, the things that we go through as part of our humanity. Thank you for technology that allows us to meet like this, even though we're physically distanced, Lord, that we can still come together as a group and, um, and grow together. I'm grateful for that. And I just ask that you bless our time together and that we take away something new to ponder, a new perspective, a shift in the way we're thinking about things. Um, and just ask that you um, bless this time as we want to grow and connect better with you and with each other. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so first 
week, if you have looked at your calendar, we're praying our inattention. That is our topic for today, praying our inattention. And this happens to be the first Psalm, which seems like a really good place to start, but we're not starting here because it's Psalm number one. We're starting here because Peterson said, this is a really good foundation for the rest of the things we're gonna study. This is a really good foundation because he says this one is not a prayer in itself, it's a preface to prayer, is what he says. So if you're gonna do a study of Psalms, first thing you wanna get right is you wanna get your head right, pretty much with anything you study. Get your head right first, and we talked about our introduction to the Psalms, what we're coming, what we're, what we're expecting to find when we get here and how we approach it. So we did that. Um, but, but there's more as you, as you come to prayer and as you come to have a response to God, you need to focus your attention, right? You need to, you need to have your mind right in that regard. You need to have your attention focused and not be distracted. So that's why this one's called praying our inattention because it's kind of hard to talk about honest, um, reflection reflections on ourselves and responses to God if we don't first have our attention focused. So this one says that we prepare ourselves to pray. In essence, we prepare ourselves to pray. We get our mind right. We come to attention. In the modern age, that is a lot easier said than done. Um, we all live such rushed, frantic lives that there's there's always something competing for our attention. It's like uh, I've heard it referred to as whack-a-mole. If you've ever played that game, whack-a-mole, there is constantly something that is demanding your attention and it's no coincidence maybe it is a coincidence um that good shepherd's vision if you've been around good shepherd long enough you know the vision you can recite it to reach and transform spiritually distracted people so we all know and we serve god um spiritually distracted that's not just referring i remember at one time when that was new to me i thought it was referring to those outside those who are spiritually distracted. I realized, no, that's all of us. If you're human in the 21st century, you are distracted. You are distracted. We're all distracted. There's so much competing for our attention. It's really hard to learn to shut any of it out for any length of time to really focus on something. And in this case, on prayer. So let me read to you the very first psalm. It's short, so I will just read it. No need to have done the homework. Um, if you haven't, that's okay. I'll read it to you. Psalm 1, book 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So again, um, full disclosure, at first reading, a lot of that didn't sink in for me either. Um, so if it didn't for you, you're not alone. It didn't for me either. But Peterson pointed out something right at the outset that kind of blew my mind when, I, when he said it, and now I can't unsee it. Did you hear it when I read the first sentence? Did you hear it? It said, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand with the sinners or sit with the mockers. Do you hear the progression there from walk to stand to sit? I didn't catch it either when I first read it. Each of those verbs gets more and more inactive, more and more stagnant, right? Peterson said, this is a person who gets set in their ways. That's why more and more inactive and just, and just passive set in their ways, lazy and passive and distracted. So, ouch. Um, it gives whole new meaning as I read that, whole new meaning to when we refer to our spiritual journey as our faith walk. Nobody says our faith set. <laughs> um, we say faith walk, it's, we're, we're moving, we're progressing, we're going somewhere, there's forward motion. So just that, see what I mean about the poetry? Just that, I'd never thought of it that way before. But that is pretty profound um, in regards to the wicked and the sinners and the mockers that he references here. He says, these are the voices of the world that we need to learn to just block out. There's voices that you that you um, listen to and there's voices you block out. And these are the ones you don't, you just don't want to fill your mind with at all times. Um, listen to what God is telling you and learn to block out some of the voices. 
Now look at verse, verse 2. Um, our delight should be in the law of the Lord. And this is telling us that we should bring an emotional response to scripture. Bring an emotional response. Delight. Combine this, combine this with the first verse, verse where we're not supposed to be passive in our faith walk. Um, and now it tells us bring our emotion to delight in God's law, to respond to it. And just quick sidebar, by law, the, the psalm says the law of the Lord a lot. And they are referencing all of scripture, not just the law portion. Just so you know, if you want to swap out words in your own mind to scripture, that, that would work represents God's entire word. So it's part of our design as a human to experience joy and delight. It's just a matter of where we find joy and delight, right? Um, what do we delight in? Is it worthy of our delight or is it not worthy? Charles Spurgeon, if you guys are familiar with him, a theologian said, man must have some delight, some supreme pleasure. His heart was never meant to be a vac vacuum. If it's not filled with the best things, it will be filled with the unworthy and disappointing. How's that for convicting? Um, so delight, what do you delight in? It's right there. It's a question right there. Do you delight in God's word and, and your connection with God? And now let's move on to the second part of that verse where it says, on his law, and again, you can substitute scripture, he meditates day and night. So let's pause here and talk about meditation, not only because the word is mentioned, but because if you're going to be talking about applying your focus and really applying your attention to something, which is what we're talking about here in this first section, it makes sense to talk about meditation. And some of you are maybe only familiar with that word in the context of Eastern religions, where they, they meditate and try to empty their minds of anything. That's not what we're talking about. Then there's another really popular meditation called mindfulness meditation, where, um, it's a really helpful tool, I gather, for for managing stress and anxiety, where you focus your mind again. So it's it's focusing your mind on your on your senses to be present in this moment as a way of managing stress and anxiety. It's supposed to be a very effective tool, um, and that's great. Also, not what we're talking about. We're talking about Christian meditation, which is something altogether different. But it does share the sense of we're we're focusing our attention. We are directing our attention to something. In this case to our connection with God, connection to the divine, to God himself. That's worthy of meditation. Yes. So it's not about mental wellness, though, though that's a great goal. This is about connection with God. And the Psalms are, are full of references to meditation. Just in case you're still a skeptic, listen to some of these scriptures. Psalms. Psalms 19, 14. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord. Psalm 49, 3, my mouth will speak words of wisdom. The meditation of my heart will give understanding. Psalm 77, 12, I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Psalm 104, 34, may my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. Psalm 119, 15, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. Psalm 119, 148, my eyes stay open through the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promises. Psalm 143.5, I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. And then this one, the ultimate meditation verse, it's extended. I'll read a few verses it's from Psalm 119, starting at 97. Oh, how I love your word. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I've kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. That's a lot to take in. So let me summarize and pull out the key words. When we meditate, we gain, this verse tells us, wisdom, insight, and understanding. So how's that? In other words, when we pay attention, we gain wisdom, insight and understanding. So what does Christian meditation look like? How do we do it? That's why this lesson is first, is to help guide you in that endeavor, to learn to come to attention, to learn to block out voices that might be really loud, our culture and everything, and learn to block those out for a time and just focus here on your connection with God. If you were around growth groups a few years back, you might remember the term Lectio Divina. We talked about what that is, Latin for divine reading. It's essentially meditating on 
um, a segment of scripture that you really think deeply about. Um, it dates back to the third century. It's not a new practice. It's a very old practice that monks used to do and pick a set of scripture and just really meditate and reflect deeply on that scripture. That's meditation. Um, you think about it. You repeat it. You really ponder it deep. You apply it to yourself. You personalize it. You might even change it into the first person as you read it. And then you pray it back to God. That's a summary of Lectio Divina. Um, if you need a quick refresher on exactly what that was, I saw there's a lot of ways to do it. But I, I thought this way was easy because it has nice alliterations. All R's. Read a short passage of scripture. Reflect. Another word for that is meditate. But let's stick with the R's. Read, reflect, respond, rest. So obviously you read it. Short passage. We're not talking about long, lengthy passages. It's hard to meditate on that if it's too long. Pick something short. Reflect on it. Another word for that is meditate on it. Whatever word or phrase catches your your attention. It, ca it captures you. It it es it uh, it um, what's the word I'm looking for? It resonates with you. It captures your heart. It captures your mind. Reflect on that. Meditate on that, and respond to it. Personalize it. Maybe re. Uh, restate it in the first person and pray it back to God and then sit it says rest contemplate what you just read digest it for a bit um, sit in the silence and just be with God for a bit there you have it Christian meditation here's some other ideas for meditation as we go through the Psalms together things you might want to do as we go through this journey through the Psalms you can sing them they've been sung for a long long time so you can try your hand at that I won't I don't sing well but Maybe it's not about sounding good, right? We all sound good when we're singing psalms. So um, you can sing them if you are inclined. Say them out loud. Read them out loud if you can. That helps too. You can memorize them. You can paraphrase them, put them in your own words, change them to the first person. You can journal about them. If you're a person who likes to journal, try journaling as you reflect on a passage of psalms. You can connect them with breath work if you're into that. Um, Breathe in, breathe out as you reflect and meditate on a psalm. See how powerful that might be for you. You can read them sequentially. You can start at the beginning of psalms. If you wanted to journey through all 150, start at the beginning and go through that way. Or you might go through and find something that really connects with your experience right now. What are you feeling right now? You might, you might do it that way. I saw this tip that really struck me. If you're reading sequentially, this is how my grandpa used to do it. He'd just start at Psalm 1, get to 150, turn back and start again um, in sequence like that. Makes it a little easier. You're not jumping around trying to find something. You just start at 1 and go. That's how grandpa did it every day. If you read that way and you come across a psalm that doesn't resonate with you, it's just you're not connecting to it um, emotionally because that's just not the, um, it's not the headspace you're in right there, right then. It's not where you are right then. Pray that psalm for someone else that you can think of who is in that um, emotional journey right now, whatever that psalm is. So if it's not the right one for where you find yourself, pray it for someone else. I thought that was great. Okay, so let's return to our text. That was a long detour on meditation, but I thought it was worth it because it's setting the stage for how we're going to journey through the psalms together. So now, looking at this first chapter, this first psalm, it starts with the word, blessed. So we talked about that. And then it tells us whose voices to block out, who not to listen to or to be influenced by. And then it tells us to meditate on scripture, that there's blessing in it. There's a blessing in this. Um, living with attention and reflection, um, introspection and meditation on God's word comes with a blessing. It's built in. You see it in um, one night. You heard it in 119 when I read Psalm 119, that really long one. It brings wisdom, insight, and understanding. But then here comes the poetry part in our back in our text. Here comes the poetry. It says, if you're living that way, if you're thinking that way, we're like a tree planted near water. It says, we're secure, we're grounded, we're rooted, we have deep roots. That is a that is an environment in which we can thrive. So that's our metaphor of a tree that's rooted and grounded and has its water source nearby. It can thrive like that. Uh, the text then gives us a metaphor of what it's like for the unrighteous person. I'll let you fill in the blanks of 
that's something to discuss, an unrighteous person. Um, or it says the wicked. It says they're like chaff that the wind blows away. So you've heard the phrase, separate the wheat from the chaff. You've heard that. Its origins are here in the Bible. Um, that's where we get that expression. So when winnowing grain in ancient Israel, ancient Judea, um, they would take, uh, well, the, the wheat kernels, I should start with, the wheat kernels are wrapped in like a husk, that's like straw. And they need to separate the, the wheat kernels that have more value from the, the straw material, um, which is not edible. So they take their pitchforks or their farm implements and they toss it up in the air. The, the grains of wheat are heavier and they land on the ground. They will fall back to the ground because they're heavier. Whereas the chaff, that husky just, um, straw material, is so light. It's just, it just floats off in the air. That's how they separate it. It just gets blown away by the wind. It's gone. If you appreciate poetry at all, you've got to appreciate that imagery. I think that is um, really powerful to think and and to and to think. I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that person that's living for a life that's of so little consequence. And and just I didn't introspect and I didn't reflect and I didn't connect that at the end of my days it's just like vapor. That's not the kind of life I want to lead. Powerful imagery. So this week, take some of those thoughts with you. Take some of that imagery with you. As you reflect, do you want to be solid and grounded and rooted like a tree? Or do you want to be light and vapor? that just floats away on the breeze. Um, think about meditation. Think about the ones that seem to resonate with you, would you sing it? Would you recite it? Would you journal it? Would you memorize it? Would you breathe it? How might you um, connect with God through prayer, praying the Psalms this week? Which of those might you want to try? So often in our spiritual life, we think of our, um, our spirituality as a me and God thing instead of a we and God thing. So I want you to think about that, that as we are praying the Psalms, um, tap into that mindset that it's, we're all praying the, together. What are there, 100 of us, 200 of us, as we go through Psalm 1? And as we pray and meditate this week, we're all praying the same Psalm. And not only that, but we're tapping into this book of Psalms, five books if we want to be literal, that have been prayed to God for all centuries around the world we're tapping into this corporate prayer. That's pretty neat to think about too. Um, Gerald Wilson in his commentary on the Psalms says this, and again, beautiful imagery. He says, whenever you read the Psalms, you are praying, singing, and reading alongside a huge crowd of faithful witnesses throughout the ages. The words you speak have been spoken thousands, even millions of times before. As you read or sing or pray, imagine off to your right stands Moses and Miriam. To your left stands David and Solomon, while behind come the voices of Jerome, St. Augustine, Luther, Calvin, and so many, many more. That's pretty cool. That's pretty powerful. So give that a try this week. Give meditation a try or the Lectio Divina. Um, work on paying attention, drowning out voices, drowning out distraction. And then next week, we're going to discuss praying our intimidation. So that should be interesting. So I'll pray us out and... Um, and we'll see how your small group discussions go. Father God, thank you for giving us words to pray. Help us pay attention this week. Shape us through our prayer and our readings so their hearts become more like yours. Give us the blessing of becoming more rooted, more grounded, more attentive. Thank you for this time we've had together today. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Okay, enjoy your small group time, ladies, um, and thanks for joining me.